producing mature disciples. To develop mature Christ followers, all spiritual leaders should give special attention to those who have a sincere desire to learn deep spiritual truths. Here now is Gene Getz. Jesus Christ really beautifully illustrated this principle, particularly as it focused on 12 men that He was preparing to change the world. We call them the 12 apostles. And the Gospels really is an unfolding of the calling of these men and preparing them. Now there was a larger group, and it was the multitude. Let's take a look at the, the context here. In Matthew 4.23, I call this Jesus' ministry. Jesus was going all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness among the people. Now remember, Jesus settled in. He lived in Capernaum, maybe in the home of James and John. He didn't have a permanent place, but He had a place to lay His head. From there, He worked for the next 18 months in that whole area. Sometimes He would leave, go to Jerusalem, but He came back. Sometimes He went way north, but He'd come back. This was the focus of His ministry. Notice what happened. He became very popular. And we can understand that when you see what happened. Verse 24, 25, Then the news about Him spread throughout Syria. The word Syria there, by the way, is, is broader than just Syria as we know it today. You'll see that defined just a little bit later here. So they brought to Him, Jesus, all those who were afflicted, those suffering from various diseases and intense pains, the demon-possessed, the epileptics, and the paralytics. And He healed them. Wow! What happened? Large crowds followed Him from Galilee, that whole area, the Decapolis. The Decapolis represents ten cities on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. These were Greek cities. That's what Decapolis means. It's a Greek word, meaning ten Greek cities. And uh, one of those Greek cities, by the way, was Damascus, which reaches today all the way up into Syria. But it's all along that eastern side of, of Galilee. So it spread into all these Gentile cities. You can imagine the thousands of people are involved in those cities. Some of those cities were huge. There's one city that became 40,000 people, one of those Gentile Greek cities. So there were thousands of people who were heard about this Jesus. Also crowds followed Him from Jerusalem. There were people that left Jerusalem to come just to follow Him. Judea, which is the larger geographical area of Jerusalem. And beyond the Jordan, which was where John was baptizing, beyond over into that area. So all these people were following Jesus. But at this point, at some point, Jesus said to these men, particularly I think, follow me. Follow me, because I want to take you into a place where I can teach you some very specific things. So we read about it, the Mount of Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 1. When He, Jesus, saw the crowds, He went up on the mountain. Now, really, that's not a mountain like we have here in Colorado, or for example. This is more of a hill, but it's high. I've never climbed it, but I've walked down it. And I, I know what it's like. I've actually taught basically where Jesus taught. It's an awesome feeling to be there teaching people with... They're looking over the Sea of Galilee, and you have your back to the sea, and you're teaching them as you sit there on the rocks. Now, notice, when He saw the crowds, He went up on the mountain, and after He sat down, His disciples came to Him. Now, who were the disciples out of all these thousands of people? We really don't know, but there are some who believe it was just perhaps Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Nathaniel, particularly Matthew hasn't become a follower yet. That's to come when he leaves his, his business as a tax collector. It could have been just five men. It could have been a larger group. It could have involved some women. It may be the wife. Maybe Peter's wife was there because it's right in that area. He was married. Who knows? But it was a small group. 
And Jesus sat there in the rocks, and He taught them, and that's what we have in the Beatitudes. And that we'll look at in the next principle. But He taught them. But you see, what happened here, a couple of things. First of all, those who had selfish motives and were intrigued only by His miraculous powers would hesitate to negotiate that rugged incline. I tell you, when Jesus started up that hill, that's rugged. So a lot of people just wouldn't follow Him. They would dissipate. But there were a group that followed Him because they were really interested in what He was teaching. Now, we can be sure that these men were there that He had chosen who followed Him and left their fishing business behind. And so He's going to take them into depth as to what it really means to be a disciple. We'll read about that in, in our next principle. It was there that Jesus shared with these men and whoever those disciples were, as I said, the deeper truths of what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, very interesting question for application, and it's this. In what creative ways can spiritual leaders today balance reaching the multitudes with devoting quality time to those who are truly seeking to understand deeper spiritual truths? Well, let me repeat the principle, and I think you'll understand it just a little bit better against the backdrop of what we've just shared. To develop mature Christ followers, and that's what Jesus was doing, you see? To develop mature Christ followers, all spiritual leaders should give special attention to those who have a sincere desire to learn deep spiritual truths. Or we might say those who indicate they have the potential. Now at this point, you need to understand. Let me try to illustrate it. And it's a marvelous study in terms of Jesus' discipling uh, approach. He talked to the multitudes. He was really concerned about the multitudes. But there was a smaller group that He was preparing to change the world, twelve men. And so you would often see Jesus with those twelve men. Now what we see here on the Mount of Beatitudes may be just a few of those men because He hasn't called all of the twelve yet in the, in, the, in the story. But He would spend time, and as you read on in the Gospels, He would spend time with the twelve. Then there were times when He would say, Peter, James, John, Follow me, I want to talk to you. And he'd pull them aside. Now sometimes Andrew was included, if you go back and study. But he was kind of on the periphery, because Peter, James, and John were the big three, that he was really preparing. And then there were times when he said, Peter, John, I'm going to let you come along here. I'm going to talk to both of you. And he'd spend time with Peter and John. Now, when you go into the story of the book of Acts, who were the primary leaders in Jerusalem when the church was born? Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John. See, Jesus was preparing them all, but He had specific preparation for these guys, these, these men. And then there were times when He would say, Peter, come on, I want to talk to you. Let's talk about what you've been hearing. What do you think of what I've been teaching? You really understand what this is. And if you go through the Gospels, you'll find that Peter's name is mentioned many, many more times than even John's name, or James, or the Twelve. It's an interesting study. If you just take and look at the names, a number of times Peter's name was repeated where Jesus spent time just with Peter, or with James, or with John. It's a beautiful model of discipling, not neglecting the multitudes but not allowing the multitudes to distract him from the focus on preparing individuals who are going to multiply his ministry many, many times. And so we see Jesus' beautiful model there. How does that apply to us? Well, in many different ways. I remember when I first got involved in church planting. One of my major, major concerns was to develop men in the church. Because I knew that if I could develop men who'd be good fathers and good husbands, they would be able to lead their wives and encourage them, their children, because this was God's model. 
And so I spent time with a group of guys. And by the way, as a result of that, it just sort of happened as I was meeting with a group of men. I invited them to study what it means to become a mature Christian. And it was in that study that uh, I took them to the qualities and the characteristics of mature man in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1. There are about 20 qualities for spiritual leaders particularly, but there are goals for every Christian man. And so we work through those qualities. How can we become mature Christian men so that we in turn lead our families and help lead the church? And uh, something happened I never planned on. I wrote a book I never planned to write, which was a book, it's called Measure of Man. And you know the fascinating thing about that? I had no idea what God was going to do with that. I didn't realize that 40 years later the book was still be in print and literally used around the world. And I often say the reason that it's successful is not because I wrote it. The reason is I borrowed the outline from the Apostle Paul. And you know where he got it? Directly from God Himself. I sometimes say that when we get to heaven, He'll get the rewards, I'll get penalized for plagiarism. <laughs> Well, the fact is, it's pretty common property, isn't it? It's right there in the Word of God. And I simply uh, took these 20 qualities, brought it into the 20th century, now the 21st century. But see, the point being is that when you take a certain group, and this applies not just to a group of men, but to a group of women as well. Because Paul says, older women teach the younger women. When you take and be sure that you don't devote all of your time to the multitudes because you build your life in to a smaller group, take them into depth, and you'll multiply your ministry many times. And Jesus, who was the greatest teacher that ever lived, modeled that principle. So here is the principle to live by. To develop mature Christ followers, all spiritual leaders should give special attention to those who have a sincere desire to learn deep spiritual truth. We want to give special attention to everybody. But Jesus illustrates you've got to give special attention to certain ones. In this case, He chose 12 men, lost one of them, Judas. But these were the men that God used to change the world. And that's why we're here, because of the message of those men, the apostles. And today, we continue in the apostles' teaching because it was the apostles Men like John and Matthew and Peter that gave us the New Testament. And later it was Paul. And so he became an apostle. And today we have the beautiful, wonderful privilege of studying all that they wrote for us so that we can become successful followers of Jesus and reproduce ourselves like Paul wrote to Timothy. The things I've taught you, Timothy, the same teach to other faithful men who will be able to teach others also, so that we will all become mature in Jesus Christ.